The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you back to the third lecture of the second movement of Debussy's La Mer. With this particular section, we are moving deeper into the scherzo-like explorations of this section of La Mer. It's really going into deeper waters. We actually left off previously in a section where there was a lot of rhythm, this bolero rhythm right in here, dun da 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 and the orchestration was becoming lighter. So we're continuing on in that particular style, in that particular approach, right here with a very cool violin solo. Now this solo actually only lasts until here, but as you can see, I have chosen to continue to score it out all the way to the end of the screen just to keep everything flowing in terms of what you can see. From right here, Tutti, the concertmaster, joins the rest of the first violins and continues to play as part of the regular group. So what is going on here? I find this fascinating because it's really got a beautiful sound to it, a sort of nervous, uh, a bit anxious, and yet very beautiful and sprightly. And what's really lovely here is how clear it is. It is accompanied very sparsely by other instruments. This is a good lesson in how to make a softer instrument, a less percussive, less loud instrument, stand out very, very nicely from an orchestral texture. Keeping that in consideration, WC has scored very soft tremolo octaves and other wide intervals in his first and second violins and thirds in the violas. And the tremolo keeps to the background with a very light texture. I'm actually the most fascinated by the oboe in this bar, how it's playing the same exact note here, this E, and then just flowing downwards from the F sharp. So the instrument's part ways here. First they're doubling and then the first oboe just cascades down chromatically and throws in another chromatic episode here. And then finally the cor anglais comes in, of course sounding down a fifth from written notes, right? So this is actually G descending down to middle C. And this note will meet up here with the first bassoon and seem to flow right into this yep da 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 So it's an extremely successful passage. And as you can see, this section here is really composed of small passages, groups of two to four bars, sometimes a little bit longer, and each of them is just sort of bouncing from one to the other. Our play of waves isn't just from instrument to instrument or from theme to theme, it's also from treatment to treatment, isn't it? From approach to approach. So starting from this very, very lightly textured accompaniment to the violin solo, the horns come in right on the tail of this violin solo. In fact, this concert B-flat in the violin solo is being dovetailed into by the horns. And of course, there's going to be an imbalance here, but the ear will follow through on this particular idea, right? Right? The rhythm and the melodic arc continues on. In fact, this is pretty much what happened in the bar before except that instead of landing on an F natural, 
they land on a written C sharp sounding F sharp. So very, very similar. But of course, then Debussy has the horns take things in a different direction. Notice here how the first and the third are doubling and it creates a very, very clear clarion-like call and yet not too big. It's a situation where you want players who can really balance and who have a lot of strong chops up there. And of course, it's perfectly correct for the first and the third to be doubling rather than the first and the second. I had a tip that was targeted at this particular question. When do you double first and second? When do you double first and third? And generally speaking, when you have a statement like this, which is somewhat heroic, somewhat commanding, then you really want the first and the third to team up because the third is kind of like a substitute leader for the section. However, when you need the first to combine with another horn player in extremely delicate intonation, then you want the accompanying player to be the second. The horns being as loud as they are, they don't really need to be carefully accompanied. And yet the texture here is really beautiful. The oboe trilling right up here, first clarinet and bassoons playing that little bolero rhythm, and just a rock bottom low D in the lower strings. And then this lovely little arc right in here from the first violins. Notice how it is octaves in the firsts rather than the firsts playing the top and the seconds playing the bottom. The effect of that is to both lessen the sound of what's going on here and also somewhat ensure its unity. Coming in right here, we have flute teaming up with English horn. The English horn, of course, is playing an octave below the first flute, and that is an extremely successful combination. The peculiar harmonic overtones of the English horn beautifully reinforce with its body of tone this note right here in the flute. So when it's done right, right, um, here you have the flute in a strengthening register, right, the middle register for the most part, and very, very easy to hear because of the way everything is orchestrated around it. And that middle register it's getting stronger from the breathy lower register. And yet at the same time, it has this wonderful mixed quality. That is covered in yet another tip from my latest book, 100 More Orchestration Tips, where I talk about how certain orchestration manuals have fallen down a bit in describing the middle register as being sort of forgettable. I think in the Adler, the first edition, first and second edition of Samuel Adler's book, The Study of Orchestration, he describes the middle register of the flute as somewhat nondescript, which I just, you know, I cannot believe that he put that dismissive of a description of one of the most unique parts of the flute's register. But what's truly unique about that register is that it's similar to vocal mixing where, say, an experienced jazz singer would mix their head voice with their chest voice and come up with this beautiful silky sound. That is somewhat what is going on in the middle register of the flute. So what does this all have to do with the English horn? Well, that is to say that that is a place in which the overtones of the English horn playing in octaves like this can really wonderfully support that silkier kind of register. And then of course, putting in the second flute in harmony right below it also reinforces that sound. So this one tiny little moment right in here is so insightful in terms of the beauty and craft of Debussy's orchestration. And you know, once again, going back to that whole legend about Ravel wanting to reorchestrate La Mer because supposedly the orchestration was so terrible. I don't see it. I don't see it. 
this one approach that I just described is the equal in insight and craft to anything that Ravel ever orchestrated. Not to take anything away from him, he was a genius. Perhaps in some ways a more perfect orchestrator than Debussy, but not necessarily a better orchestrator, if you see what I mean. That is to say that Debussy was in a lot of ways coming at this approach of orchestration for the first time without a huge amount of help from other orchestrators, whereas Ravel, to an extent, had this pathway explored for him a lot by Debussy coming before. All right, so to get back to the orchestration, we have little reactions here. Really lovely, uh, quick staccatos reaching upwards in the first and the seconds. Little bit of pizzicato there on the third beat. This is really lovely in here the rooting double bass low E, and then the cellos hitting that same note an octave higher, and then landing with both an accent and a tenuto on the B flat above. So long direct bow with a pushing accent at the beginning, and then ending with a big staccato at the end of a crescendo. Very, very lovely idea. And Probably what will be the most throwaway thing right in here is this run right in here with the harp. It's going to be difficult to hear, but probably more easy to hear in the scope of a chamber orchestra, which is just as we are listening to in the Kaleidoscope Orchestra recording of their performance of last year. Then bassoons coming in and filling in the harmony above the cellos. That's all great. On the next page, we have the strings really making something a little bit more out of that bump. And as this pushes forward in a nice big crescendo, we are going to sort of fall off the edge into this pianissimo all of a sudden. So you see the big push coming in here also from the winds little bit of piccolo there at the end, English horn, clarinets, bassoons, all pretty emphatic. Notice the oboe just basically takes a break and gets ready for its solo. And right under that, we have these lovely dancing horns. This is just great scoring. Notice the one, two, three, four scoring with the third player as the upper middle voice and the second as the lower middle voice. And then of course you've got the fourth player as the octave to the first. Very, very nicely done. And it has this lovely sound in the background, which you can hear especially as the horns push forward with the rest of the orchestra. <clears throat> also listen to this lovely pizzicato line in here, slowly walking its way up all the way to this high A flat, landing right here on this very uncourteous A natural. There's no cautionary accidental on that. And once again, we have traded off just a couple of bars of a beautiful approach that could have gone on for an entire page or two, directly into another brief section, three bars long, and then there's a section after that that's two bars, and three bars, and four bars. So you can see it's all composed of little effortlessly interconnecting sections that really are tossed from place to place, just like the waves playing, as I mentioned before. Here we get to a beautifully unique section with the piccolo on top, the tremolo violas in the middle, and the horn at the bottom. So don't get confused here, this is sounding down a fifth, right? So this is A going to G sharp, just like we've got here, A, G sharp, G natural, F sharp, E sharp, right? So we see that same thing here. E, D sharp, D natural, C sharp, B sharp. Written, sounding down a fifth. <clears throat> this has, once again, a beautiful, insightful, cunningly crafted effect. You have the lovely strength of the horn below, even played pianissimo. Beautifully expressive, clear, with its body of tone, pushing at 
the tremolo violas, which have a compatible tone when played softly, and the piccolos above playing right on the fourth overtone of the solo horn's body of tone. And that sets up this wonderful stack of octaves. Really, it's like one instrument playing that has this incredible quality to it. So listen for that lovely approach. And then, of course, right in here, you'll probably mainly hear the first horn rather than the second harmonizing underneath. The first horn will follow the arc of the strings as they go downhill. So right in here, it's kind of interesting that it is the violas that play unison suddenly with the first horn, and then the seconds that take up the octave, and then the firsts that take up the octave above that. Meanwhile, <laughs> the strings and the winds, the other players, have pretty much hit with a great emphasis this tonality here of A major. We've got the F trumpet playing a written G sharp, which sounds C sharp above, and then we have these A thirds, A and C sharp, at an octave apart. This A doubling the lower note here of the divisi second violins, and so on. So all of that is going on, and right in the middle of it, playing a little bit of a counter melody to the lovely triple octave horns, violas, and piccolo, once again, we've got this incredible oboe solo. And we're seeing that second theme come out. All right, so that is playing counterpoint to that other melody. There is a hell of a lot of counterpoint in La Mer, and especially in the second movement, where you have got motion in the melody, you've got motion in the bass, uh, and you've got counter melodies playing at the same time. So this is the kind of thing that really would have been instructive and very well appreciated by composers who had a bent for counterpoint and yet also embraced the feeling of this early 20th century music, which some call impressionistic, uh, and yet the impressionist composers, the so-called impressionist composers, felt that their music was so much more than impressionist. They would probably acknowledge that there were impressionist elements in it, but Debussy was also to use symbolic elements, so he was in some ways a symbolist as much as he was an impressionist. And of course, he could probably find many other elements to his music. So he just felt that he was right, a post-romantic composer in France. It's probably how he would term himself. So when we get to here, not only does the first horn combine with the strings and then that entire arc that was set in motion gets telescoped into the descent of the strings, we see the oboe start to stand out here with a lot of help from the motion of the harps and from the glockenspiel interpreting what the oboe is doing, but in tuplets rather than triplets. And it just gives this wonderful little glistening sound two octaves above the oboe. And in fact, that two octave overtone from the oboe is one that is beautifully reinforced. Notice how the second oboe takes over right on this note, and if the oboe players are doing it right, then it really feels as if the first oboe player has continued on with no break. That takes us to right here. <laughs> and speaking of Lily Boulanger, I would say if you are a student of her music and you have watched some of my analyses of her orchestration in the past, pay special attention to these last seven bars on this screen because a lot of what you hear here is obviously music that influenced her in her scoring. Not to say that there's anything here that sounds like Lily stole from it, but more that it was a heavy influence on her. And some of those things that you could listen for is 
the way the horns play inside the strings here very very beautifully the way there is an active sense of counterpoint as I was mentioning before inside the music you notice that there are three voices at work in here three lines of motion in the strings and yet there is no sense in which this is not fully integrated and working together I love each of these lines the firsts playing octaves with the violas the seconds right in the middle here the cellos which really start to stand out here I would say as the main idea in this little chorale and then of course the horns playing from the inside with their own unique approach here here the second and third are playing unison B's which will sound right inside here right under the violas and if they are careful and they blend together with the strings they provide this wonderful warmth inside there that makes the strings feel all the more cushiony even though they are essentially playing in counterpoint especially right in here this reminds me so much of the direction that Lily ended up going and then here taking out most of the players so you've got just a couple of solo firsts a couple of solo seconds a couple of solo violas and so on all the way down to the cellos and then here are the others divisi a little bit of a pluck there and of course changing the harmonic context each time even though it's essentially the same gesture with a little contrary motion in the harp and I just really love the incredible solitary loneliness of the first horn right in here you can see why Debussy teams up the second and third right in here rather than the third and the fourth this has to lead effortlessly to the first playing this written B and they're going to be taking their cue from the second so even though it's the second playing and then the first this is another example of teamwork between the second and the first so the second is completely setting this up for the first to take over which would be a lot less smooth if this were the third and the fourth playing this together so by making it the second playing under the third this just goes right into this B really lovely and of course with the third as the top voice here that gives the first a chance to really control this precisely the softness of this note and the absolute correct intonation that has to play right inside this chamber-like set of eight string players and over all of this another touch that I feel is very reminiscent of Lily in retrospect we've got the piccolo interlacing its solo with the first flute so what is so extraordinary about this well what is once again ingenious and yet beautifully crafted is the sense here that Debussy is trying to have it both ways and achieving that goal <laughs> by having his piccolo solo play across the middle to low register and then having the first flute take over not just because it gets too low for the piccolo to continue on but because that same quality of register is preserved this is also the middle to lower register of the first flute so that same quality of almost folk playing or that innocence the real lightness of color and charm that you hear in the middle register of both flute family members is preserved by just maintaining that changing off to go into separate registers so in case people are not quite getting what I'm saying this of course sounds an octave higher right so we're starting off on this E actually sounding the E above the staff and then floating down to this same E that is dovetailed by the first so it's middle to low register and then it stays in that same middle to low register of the other instrument so there's a beautiful consistency of timbre now Debussy could have actually scored these first six notes 
all for first flute and started off here, written an octave above, and then just continuing on with this and coming back out again. But that high E would have been brighter and more orchestra-like in its character, more idealized. So by keeping it with the piccolo, there is a sense of kind of roughness and, as I was saying before, innocence, rather than this beautifully polished crystalline approach that you would get from the high register of the flute. So listen for all of those things. It's really too much for me to review with you in retrospect as I sometimes do because there are so many different approaches, but just briefly, listen for the Lily Boulanger kind of quality right in here. And for the wonderful independence here and counterpoint of the different parts, the lovely stack of triple octaves here with the piccolo on top, the horn on the bottom, and the tremolo violas in the middle. And this really great push here that just pushes right off the cliff back to pianissimo once again. Not to mention the English horn playing an octave below the first flute in its middle register and for that wonderful quality once again. The horns accompanied by this bolero pattern in the lower winds and then of course just starting everything off the violin solo wonderfully isolated, lonely, a bit frenetic, in front of extremely soft accompaniments in the tremolo strings and little throwaway lines from the oboe family. Listen for all of those elements, and then I'll see you on the next screen. Now in the second half of this lecture, we're going to see that Debussy is starting to take on longer stretches with a similar approach and then developing melodic material across it. So over the course of these episodes, the orchestration evolves as it naturally would, but isn't so much of one approach exchanging with another as the melody develops over it. Rather, it's a case where things grow more organically. And as you can see here for this entire screen, it's pretty much one approach, isn't it? Across eight bars. And then in the next screen, you'll see that the approach changes, but it develops out of this particular approach. So starting off here uh, with this big pluck pluck, which is pretty much all you're going to hear at first, uh, plus a bit of horns barking right in there. Once again, we've got the second and the third teamed up. And I think that that is so that the first has a chance to sort of shape their lip and prepare to play very softly, very high, right? So their partner is going to eventually be the first and the third, and that's a good team up here. So we have the second playing below the horn. Once again, the first is gonna be listening to both the third and the second, and then play that high note up there. So it really is a case of using the most optimum players to prepare the first for that high F. And of course, those horn players are basically just trading off with the trumpet right in here. If we look at the actual pitches right here, the trumpets are actually playing up a fourth, aren't they? So this is actually an E third, E and G, and this is also E and G, but playing an octave lower. So the octaves are trading off with each other, even though they're essentially written on the same pitches. Just remember that when the trumpets and the horns in La Mer are playing on the same pitches, they're actually an octave apart. The trumpets sounding up a fourth and the horn sounding down a fifth. Notice that the trumpets are muted right in here. So they have that really bright, edgy sound. Whether they're barking out this bar right in here 
or toning down and then playing softly. And you can really hear them edging up on the end of the bar every single time, even though they are marked pianissimo staccato. I really love this trade-off here of this idea. With the horns now playing a G minor third, it's the same one that we see here, isn't it? Only it's down an octave from here. So starting off G and B flat sounding in the staff, right? So G and B flat, we would call that four, G four and B flat four. And then the flutes answering an octave higher. And then when they come to the end of their little bit of the bolero rhythm, dun, da, 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 dun, da, 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 right? We have that same idea happening in here rhythmically. The trumpets pick it up and push right back into the horns. Notice they are starting on the same pitches as the horns, but then pushing up, and then the music lands back on the horns on those same pitches, trading off again and continuing on. So that is the little bolero rhythm background. And what's lovely here is that the accompaniment in other rhythmic elements is not so predictable. So for instance, there isn't a big heavy downbeat like on a snare drum or something like that. We have the second beat on triangle and the beat of three and on cymbal. And that pretty much continues on for this entire screen. And then we have harp coming in and just basically playing those same pitches, G and B flat, unison with the horns, unison with the flutes, and then starting off on the same pitches as the trumpet and that just goes back and forth itself for the entire screen. Now what's going on in the strings? This lovely flurrying downwards between the two groups of divisi firsts. And it's a tricky little riff to play, but seeing as how it's divided between two groups of players, and it's also just right under the fingers, it's not too big of a stretch. The rest of the strings land on this lovely cushion of background chords, except for the cellos, which start off a very sonorous, yearning melody. And here I feel Debussy is really coming into his own. <laughs> this is like his reaction. He's inside of the music. This is him just really feeling what is going on around him. It's an intense moment. And what's interesting here is that he doesn't need to add any kind of doubling. The cellos, even a limited amount of cellos, as you might hear from the performance that we're going to listen to in a few minutes by Kaleidoscope, I think that they only have like six or eight cellos. That is enough. It's an extremely bright, powerful register for the cellos to be playing. Just perfectly scored for the tenor register and really crying out inside this wonderfully calculated texture. So there doesn't need to be any doubling by bassoon or English horn or any other instrument. They sound perfect the way that they are. Now here, as the music intensifies, Debussy adds second and fourth horns, and this is a really, really great combination as well. Once again, talking about the roles of the players, here we're teaming up the two lower players, and this could have easily been first and second if it weren't for the fact that Debussy has plans for the first coming up. So by having the second and fourth take over this role of playing this counter melody with the cellos and the violas, which we'll discuss in a second, then he frees up the first horn to play along with the violas and cellos, while the second and fourth continue their little counter melody below and then just meander on as the music changes and dies down. Okay, so as I said, before this all evolves out of what happened before and we can see how that is working with the seconds taking over that nudging up roll that the trumpets had before and now they're not even in this screen because there isn't a trumpet part I just left it out so 
the seconds are taking over on pushing upwards in those triplets, the flutes and oboes now doubling, and also freeing up the horns. So there's that da 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 and we have that da 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 We have that syncopation of four eighth notes playing across three bars of six eight. Then you see the building intensity as the clarinets come in and start playing the same exact thing an octave lower. And the first join up with the seconds and start doubling what is playing in the flutes and oboes. So it really becomes intense and fluttery right there towards the end of this passage. Meanwhile, <laughs> these lovely rooting fifths in the double basses and a little bit of a two plucks in the harps. Some bassoons helping out with the harmony as well, right? So that just leaves this really great team up here of very intense violas plus cellos. Now I've left this till last because I want to talk about this unique combination. Here you've got the cellos in their tenor register, as I mentioned before, just very bright and sonorous and strong, playing unison with the violas, which are actually in their middle register and not necessarily something that is going to be as chesty and bright as, say, the violas playing maybe an octave higher up on their brighter A string. But all the same, it's really all about the cello's tone right in here. The violas are going to combine with it and make it thicker and make it a little bit broader, but they aren't going to make it necessarily brighter, right? But Debussy knows that and he wants that quality because he has to have these lines play in counterpoint with the horns. So this guarantees that they won't get lost facing these two unison low horns right in here. So it's a bit of counterpoint at first with the strings and the horns playing against each other. And then right in here, as I mentioned before, the violas and cellos walk upwards. And as they do, the first horn comes in in unison. And then right here at the top, <laughs> the first and the third start to double what is going on here with these thirds, which are, once again, unison with each other in both the viola and cello parts. It's really interesting, isn't it, how this same exact idea is played an octave lower by the bassoons as everything kind of cascades downwards. The low horns meandering onwards, the cello and harp kind of collapsing together downwards, and of course the violas taking over this whole idea of da 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 only, of course, down two octaves from where the violins were playing it in the bar before. Now our second passage begins for the remainder of this lecture, and this is also an example of a progressive approach evolving rather than necessarily just exchanging one approach for the next, for the next, for the next. So we're starting off here with this lovely little unison solo, the first A clarinet sounding the same notes as the first oboe, and yet another of those clarinet plus oboe solo unisons that sounds terrific, which kind of makes it confusing to me why people say that this is a bad combination. I just don't see it. Most examples I've seen crafted by expert orchestrators really show the opposite, that the two instruments really do combine beautifully. And here in the strong middle register of the first oboe right in here and the lower clarino register of the clarinet, it's a perfect combination. But what fascinates me here is not so much this unison. It is more this lovely pushing effect. The tremolo string is kind of going da 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 and going across the different registers starting with violas, cellos, and basses and then taking everything an octave higher and once again notice like the the notes here are an A fifth going to a C sharp fourth A and E pushing over to C sharp and F sharp notice that these two intervals are slurred and I think 
what Debussy is communicating here is that he really wants it to feel like they are slurred, even though, of course, with unmeasured tremolo like that, it really is impossible to slur anything. It's more of a marking that is in context, that is outlining something that's expressive. But it's the same intervals played across basses, cellos, and violas, going to cellos, violas, and seconds, and then stepping over from violas, seconds, and then all the way up to firsts, even an octave higher. What's cool about this is it really allows the players to just set where their fingers are and not have to jump around from register to register on their instruments. But the best thing about it is this wonderful little shoving effect. <laughs> it just kind of feels like the instruments are almost lifting something and putting it onto a shelf. Like sort of da da, da da, with their tremolos. And of course, just little bits and pieces of support coming in, like the horns right in here, and these plucks, which are very audible on harp. It's so delicately scored that it's very easy to hear harp right in here. Now, speaking of progressing forwards, rather than necessarily just trading off to a new approach, the strings continue on with their tremolo, but here it's just those octaves, which we've seen before, you know, B, A, E, and so on, and, and continuing on down there uh, with a little bit of harmony in the cellos and the same notes played harmonized by first and third horn and then the second taking over and so on and the flute family and oboe family kind of going nuts on it i love the way that this descends down like this with the english horn sort of ripping up to this written d and then the first oboe coming in and doubling the first flute just a really lovely wonderfully balanced gesture right in there and of course clarinets playing some harmony right in there. Once again, you'll be able to hear the harps very nicely right in there. There's really, really great harp scoring in here. This chord, maybe not so much, but it's good that it's in there. The competition right here for this harpist is really this by the trumpet. Uh, and when you see a a solo like this written for F trumpet, you just have to remember that everything sounds up a perfect fourth, right? So this is actually G sharp on a C trumpet, which is a fairly high note. Uh, of course, crescendo molto going towards this point. It's really about the same effort for a trumpet player playing an F instrument as it would be for a B flat or a C playing up to those high notes. There really isn't a whole lot of difference in terms of control, in terms of quality of register and everything else. Some purists might prefer playing this on an F just to get the original context of that era and everything else, but I generally see these parts played on a C trumpet. Now here you have A2 coming in right there, and it just has a beautiful bright sound there with both trumpets. Here we have more of that kind of shoving sound, right? And it's going from tenuto to tenuto. So that makes this a portato, right? A sort of a, 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 right? So you do feel that slight sense of pulse right in there. Meanwhile, the strings are kind of breaking things up with sol ponticello, sur le chevalet, going to pizzicato, and then this lovely push it sort of anticipates what the trumpets are about to play. So you have this sweep up here by violas and cellos, dovetailing right into the first and second violins, sweeping all the way up to A sharp. Really sounds convincing there. And that leaves this really, really great cushion right in here, this lovely hanging chord, some rolled suspended cymbal, diminuendoing down to pianissimo and low strings right in here doubled by bassoons you've got your brass beautiful bright and warm in the middle and then fading with the rest of the orchestra and the winds above this is just a perfectly balanced chord right in here and notice that everybody has got the same dynamics marked across sections 
in my evaluations, I saw a lot of brass scoring where the brass was really covering some of the same registers as winds and strings, and there was no attempt made to really balance out the effect of that brass playing over the strings. And so I mentioned a lot that, look, you should just bring the dynamic level of the brass down in integrated scoring like this. But in a case like this, where you really have the brass in the middle, the winds on the top or on the bottom, and the same thing with the strings, then it balances out great without having to change the dynamic markings. And as things fade, you hear these lovely gleaming harps playing these A-sharp octaves, ottava. And that's where I will leave you. So listen for the quality of that chord. Listen for how the strings just rip across the registers all the way up to this A-sharp right underneath and then pushing at the trumpet right in here. Listen to how the two trumpets sound together after the first solo and how really high this high G-sharp is. And for the portato here in the horns and the winds, and then, of course, the lovely frantic staccato playing right in here in these upper winds and the gleaming harps, which are actually fairly audible considering the thickness of the texture right in here, not to mention the tremolo strings and so on, and the horns playing in the middle. And then, of course, the beginning of that passage, the combination of the clarinet and oboe and the wonderful sort of lifting effect of these tremolos in the strings. And then, of course, before that, the passage that had a beautiful cello section solo that was eventually joined here by the violas playing in counterpoint with the low horns. And then how the first horn joined up with that middle string melody and then played unison for the first and third on this harmonized melody and of course the counterpoint continuing on with the low horns and eventually fading out along with the bassoons picking that up an octave lower. And then the beginning of the passage, that lovely bolero rhythm playing right in here, sort of launched from this pizzicato with the horns and the trumpets trading off in octaves, first on these sounding E minor thirds and then going to these sounding G minor thirds trading off between horns, flutes, and trumpet, sort of pushing up into the next bar each time. And then, of course, the unleashing of this beautiful cello melody right in here. So listen for all of those things, and I will see you in a couple of days for the next part of this, 2D, where the music gets even more intense, if that were possible.